Welcome into the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Excited about today's show, folks. Um, we're going to go on a little bit of a different trip today. We've talked before in the past about aliens, alien abduction, and the trauma that comes with alien abduction. I want to revisit this topic today with a special guest. This topic fascinates me, and I'll tell you why. I continue to come back to this topic because I, have one, have had experiences with, we'll, we'll say ghosts. I'll put it that way. I, I don't know that I've ever had an experience with the demonic, although I've had something strange happen with an ovulus um, that def- that has told me that a demon's been nearby. I've smelled things that may have potentially been demonic, but I've never had anything manifest in front of me. I don't know that I've had anything cryptid come across me in the woods, although I've had strange things happen out in the woods. Aliens are something that I've never encountered firsthand, although I've seen something in the sky that's been unusual. And I don't know that I can explain it as something alien, but a strange light in the sky. An alien abduction to me seems unusual. And it fascinates me when people tell me that they've had this experience. I don't discount it at all, but I find it fascinating. So let's get into our guest today. We'll talk a little bit about what these particular abductees go through. And how we know it's a genuine experience from someone who may potentially have a mental illness or may potentially have something where, I don't want to say they wish this particular horrifying experience happens, but maybe there's a cry for help here. Our guest, Leslie Mitchell Clark, is a Toronto-based certified clinical hypnotherapist who specializes in a number of modalities, including working with individuals who feel that they have had experiences with extraterrestrial beings. Most of this fascinating work, as well as metaphysical therapy, such as past life and her life regression, takes place at Leslie's Toronto Hypnosis Clinic, Lightwork Hypnosis. Prior to her work in hypnotherapy, Leslie also has had a busy career as an actor, dancer, and vocalist. And for the past 20 years, she's also been a top jazz and media consultant with an array of Grammy and Juno-winning clients, as well as major jazz festivals and record labels. Leslie is currently the director of LMC Media, with offices in both Toronto and Leslie's hometown of New York City. Uh, She's also a busy arts writer, contributing regularly to a variety of publications. Let's welcome in to Darkness Radio, Leslie Mitchell-Clark. Hi, Leslie. Welcome in. Tim, it is so good to be here, and I feel absolutely exhausted after that introduction. Oh, no, 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 no reason to, no reason I'm going to have to trim that down. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good intro. I like it. It's, you know, I, well, I, uh, I always have admiration for someone who's who stuck it out and had a career in arts before they, they get to another career because you've been through the ringer. Oh, boy. Well, you know, it's it, it was actually the family business. Uh, my late dad was a multiple Emmy winning uh, comedy writer and television producer. And he worked with Norman Lear for many years and produced oh, wow. all in the family and good times and the Jeffersons. And he created Mork and Mindy for Robin Williams and um, really? had an Emmy for Mary Tyler Moore. Many, all the, all the, uh, I think all the really cool shows of the day he worked on, and he began his career writing uh, uh, for Get Smart. Wow. <laughs> so, you you so, just named uh, like my all dad, my favorite shows. Oh, boy. They were great. But uh, I tell you, the funnier my dad got on screen, the more unfunny he was at home. Oh, no. <laughs> it wasn't like a big acceleration of humor. He it was. I think it just took all he had, you know. You know how working in television is, you know, 14, 16 hours a day, whatever it takes, right? Right. So, um, I, but uh, God I hate bless to, him anyway. I hate to ask the question, is that why, why there's the crossover to therapy or is this the... <laughs> well, um, you know, I have always been interested equally in the arts and mental health care. And even as a young teenager, I was volunteering at the state hospital and uh when i was a when i was a a university student not here in minneapolis but uh, but in um uh vermilion south dakota where i where i finished school um i put myself through school working 
on the graveyard shift as first a psychiatric aide, then a psychiatric technician. So I saw, you know, mental, because I am really, really bloody old. I mean, dinosaurs no. were roaming the earth nah. when I was conceived. But anyway, uh, I saw mental health care really in a what we would consider a very primitive state now. Mm -hmm. uh, now we would view it that way, but because before we had psychotropic drugs, which could curtail violent impulses, things like Thorazine, um, there was there were very few options in managing someone in a violent psychotic state. We had padded rooms, we had straight jackets. I mean, we had tubs of warm water. We would put them. I, it was it was incredibly primitive by today's standards. So, um, psychotropic medications, flawed though they may be, um, have prevented a lot of um, more horrible things because I've seen them. You know, I wouldn't want to go back backwards. That's for sure. Just a side so, sidebar here, side note. What do you think about ketamine therapy and, and how it's used in, in the psych, psych, psychological field? Oh, um, well, you know, interestingly enough, now I'm, my mind is open, you know, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of times it's a question of dosage or, or you know, whatever it is. But I have um, in just my straight ahead hypnotherapy work and I work as a consultant for a psychology firm. So I'm quite busy with straight ahead stuff. I have seen it have miraculous results for depression. Mm -hmm. um, so apparently you you know with a fairly high percentage of people whatever this whatever this chemical does it it must somehow stimulate endorphin production or dopamine production i you know i'm not quite sure how it works but i also have several friends who have had um amazing success also with microdosing um lsd now yeah. All that, I mean, back in the day, you know, I certainly wasn't afraid to experience some some um, supplements like that. <laughs> I did. But uh, the idea of being hot, that high now is very scary to me. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, but of course, I guess microdose is a my it's not dosing micro dot. That's something else. Right. But a microdose, um, I imagine it's so controlled that. Um, you're not even aware in your conscious mind of of your perceptive perceptions being altered. Yeah, I'm open to it. I've all I can say is I've heard nothing negative from anyone who's tried it, and I had expected maybe I would. Um, I've heard nothing negative thus far, except one person who was apparently resistant to the ketamine treatment. She tried it and did it extended times and it just for her didn't work for whatever reason. I've seen with some friends and some loved ones that have had depression issues and some mental health issues that have used ketamine. They've had mm -hmm. some great success with it in small doses. I, I yeah. bring this up because of the recent Matthew Perry uh, issue oh, um, and dear. the overdose. And it's a, it's a uh. high profile issue um, where people who have issues with addiction tend to want to get a hold of it and want to get a hold of it in higher quantities once it's prescribed to them. Um, and th and yes. that's the only, that's the only downside to it is it, it is highly addictive. Um, and, and I guess I'll, I'll throw this in. in it's, uh, the, yeah. And the other side of it where, where you'd mentioned psilocybin um, and using it with say people with PTSD and extreme PTSD where microdosing mm -hmm. psilocybin mm -hmm. has been shown to, potentially mm -hmm. clear up PTSD. Now, I want to bring this back around to our subject today where, where we're talking about uh, alien abduction or, or even past life regressions that are people who've had trauma from both. Um, we're potentially microdosing psilocybin could be, it, could it work hand in hand with, with other, with talk therapy and other, other, you know, hypnotherapy and other treatments could that be a, a, a way to help oh, somebody? Oh, it does. This? It does work. 
Absolutely. In fact, I, I would say that a doctor will probably only uh, prescribe or authorize um, uh, a ketamine or a um, microdosing course of medicine if there is also therapy involved. So that's uh, that's a, uh, a very important cog. And now we also have some amazing techniques uh, for dealing with trauma and the release of traumatic events. Um, uh, you may have heard of uh, EMDR. Yes. And it involves rapid. It involves movement of the eyes um, and and stimulating the different sides of the brain. That is an earth shakingly powerful treatment. Yeah. So yeah. there are things that are come on the horizon that are going to be very very different from the kinds of medicines that we've used. I have a feeling that um, uh, you know SSRIs, antidepressants as we know them. Um, are going to be replaced by more effective uh, treatments. Because remember, I think it's, uh, what is it, up as high as 70%? At least half the people that are on SSRI or SNRIs are getting no relief from oh gosh. the medicine. That's now, the that doesn't mean we shouldn't have it because half the people are. But the question is, why? Why? You know, so we we're these questions are we're living in the in the time in the era of the real time mapping of the brain, mm -hmm. which would allow us to discover the answers to some of these things that have been, you know, mystifying. Uh, but there are many interesting techniques coming up on the horizon. Now, one thing I wanted to say about trauma, though, is that, uh, you know, I was part of, um, as a as a hypnotherapist, as a master hypnotherapist regressionist, I was uh, uh, vetted to be a mental health care professional as part of Kathleen Martin's Experiencer Research Program, which was uh, uh, handled under the auspices of MUFON. Okay. And it was a 10 year long program, Tim, 10 years. And during that time, I saw or many people who were referred to me by MUFON. Now, of course, by the time they got to me, I think probably most people with mental health issues had already been weeded out because they have, you know, they have investigators with boots on in the field. Yes. And they, um, um, are trained to, you know, kind of look for that kind of thing. But the results of the testing, uh, I mean, the research program rather, were that only maybe 20% of the experiences that all of the people reported and et cetera, et cetera, were traumatic or upsetting or disturbing. 30% were what I would call ecstatic experiences, like a big spiritual uplift, if you will. Hmm. And the rest were just benign. So the reality here is we don't really have thousands and thousands and millions of people who have been traumatized by the ETs. What we have is real-time communication going on uh, that is sometimes misunderstood. Um, uh, it's it's a very complex issue. Some of the experiences that people have are physical. In other words, their bodies are, you know, taken somewhere else. Most often in a craft, but it could be through some type of um, wormhole or you know interdimensional door as well. There was all of that going on as well. And um, we, those, those people are, um, are often, uh, when, they, when they do begin to have memories bleed through, it's usually around midlife. Now, I think the idea of suppressing our memories is not evil. I think it has been the idea that um, this is going to be more helpful for us. But I also think that the ETs have developed, and I'm speaking of many groups okay. of species and beings, I think that they have as a unified organization, a Gene Roddenberry-like, you know, 
unified organization, I think that they have discovered a lot more about uh, their genetic cousins, us, you know, and that we are very curious people and it is unhealthy for us to suppress memories and compartmentalize them in the way that it has been artificially done both by ETs and I would say by government organizations as well. You know, we can't rule that out. So, uh, but most of the people had very benign experiences. As I said, some of them were in what you would call astral bodies. They weren't physically taken. And what I found most particularly is um, childhood experiencers. And I believe that almost all experiencers are, began having these episodes in childhood. I don't mm -hmm. think it's something that just pops, just, just happens when you're 30 or 40 or whatever. No, I think, I think it's an ongoing thing. And uh, many of these individuals um, have, um, have had, well, how shall I put it, even emotional relationships with some of the beings that are engaging with them. Okay. And it begins when they're small and they're often taken to have learning experiences on board a large mothership, if you will. I mean, these are the things that I'm hearing. I should make that, you know, I always have a I always have a skeptical eye. I'm simply telling you the kinds of things that I'm hearing from very credible people. And remember, experiencers, it's not like it's uh, you know, those, you know, some old Crap, you can't even say that. Some people from down south are like one tooth, some hillbillies, or, you know, it's not that. <laughs> okay, Experiencers right. cross all levels of ethnicity, all levels of faith, all levels of education, all levels of uh, social status. Um, I have had judges, and uh, probably, the probably though, the group um, of people that statistically, according to my little situation um teachers i have more teachers really than probably anything else any other profession why that is i can't tell you but it makes sense to me um somehow so um there you go. But people of all is, temperaments and styles. Now, you asked me earlier a little. Oh, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. I was going to say, t teachers, it, it, would that be because of the temperament? Is it because they're more understanding? Is it because they're able to communicate better? Why do you suppose teachers? I think because one of the things that I believe the ETs as as in all of their diversity i believe they are seeking a uh, psychic ability because it makes it easier for them to communicate it makes it easier for them to do what they do as far as transporting people or working with them in the astral state it makes everything easier so i would say that teachers as a group the good ones the inspired teachers probably all have pretty psychic ability. They're probably all able to tune into their students. I remember, you know, there's some teachers in school, you couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> and I think, my God, she must be reading, reading my mind. Yeah. As I'm trying to sneak off to the, to the girl's bathroom for a smoke. You know, I mean, I think it's, a, I think psychic ability is the thing that they're looking for. And I think it runs very high in uh, people in the teaching profession or the kind of people that are open enough to come see me. Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know, uh, because absolutely. you're dealing with an, you're dealing with, you know, an open person usually. Who, um, but um, so, as I said earlier, most people do come to me in midlife because they are beginning to have, um, you know, breakthroughs like flashes and, um, and that usually, that's just a sign that any kind of memory block or suppression is dissolving. I don't think they can last more than 20 years myself. I don't believe that that technology exists with either ETs or humans. Okay, so there's a bit of a creep factor here, though, Leslie. So what you're describing is a grooming process. 
because you're telling me at, at, at my age, in middle age, that I'm if I haven't had an experience by now, I'm probably never ever going to have an experience where I'm going to be abducted. Um, the the chances are slim because I would have had to have been taken at a young age, and I probably would have had to have been probably groomed and 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 I would have had to have been warmed up, so to speak, to the idea that I was going to have multiple encounters with these beings and warmed up to it. And then mm-hmm. something was going to, I mean, I, there's a process here and obviously there's a process and that they have an agenda, right? Well, let's, let's look at it as more of a collaborative thing. Um, I, I think that in the interlife, when we get ready to come into this physical body, you know, like after your most recent incarnation and you're preparing to either come back to the earthly realm, realm or not, um, I think that many of those relationships, these long-term relationships that people have with, with ETs and the work that they're doing in their etheric body, I think much of that is put in place before the person arrives in physical form because we are all moving towards you know the i mean people are moving towards awareness they are they okay. are moving towards awareness and it doesn't take all the people on the planet to be aware to bring about change we only need about half the people to become aware that we have an interdependent universe and right now, I think a lot of the ETs see us as like three-year-olds toddling around with a flamethrower. I think that, uh, you know, the nuclear weapons have the possibility to uh, to rip space and time. And um, and that's very frightening. Otherwise, why would we why would we regularly have so many instances of like fleets of uh, of, of uh, what is it they call now? Um, uh, Unident- UAPs, unidentified aerial, unidentified aerial phenomena, you know, buzzing over nuclear um, uh, silos and turning them off. Yeah, I mean, we that happens. It happened in Russia. Um, uh, it's it's happened so many times. I I can't even count. And many times in the American mid- Midwest, and also in uh, what we call the dew line. Now, I, are you familiar with that term? The dew line? I, I have heard it, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. What, well, what it is, is there are a series. This is a Cold War era uh, uh, installation. There are a series of military bases, nuclear, nuclear armed military bases that are run by Canada and the United States that runs along a very northern part of Canada. The idea was that so if we thought the Russians were lobbing something over at us, we could get them first. Mm-hmm. So that was the thinking behind the dew line. But um, there is also a lot of very specialized um, military activity going on out there. You know, they don't exactly have a, a, a lot of eyes on them at any given time. And um, many of the many of the experiencers that I have worked with are from military families where the father was stationed in one or more of the bases in the dew line. And those young people were were, as you say, at groomed is a very creepy word, but they were drawn in um as cadets into some type of uh, a program that involved both a specific group of ETs and um, and the American uh, international um, armed forces. So uh, so there is there is a creepy element, but I I have to tell you the creepiest stuff that I hear about the worst creepiest most awful stuff I hear always involves a human component. Okay. Uh, Leslie, I have to ask this question before, before we go too far here and, and bear with me here. You brought up an interesting point and that's this. 
Um, recently, I, I like to go down rabbit holes when I'm, especially in the morning as I'm having my morning coffee. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll get caught up in Apple News and I'll start looking at different interviews. One of the interviews I saw recently, um, mm -hmm. and, and I like to go down both sides of the political spectrum. I know we're not a political show, but I like to, especially with the upcoming election, I like to look, take a look at all candidates, all sides of the political spectrum. I was looking at candidate Trump's, one of his interviews, because he's doing very few of them. Uh, and I caught one of his podcast interviews. I wanted to check out one of his podcast interviews. Interestingly enough, he was asked the question, what is the number oh. one, one, number one threat in the world today? And he said it was nuclear weapons. And then this is where I'm getting around to now. I want to bring it back to our subject today. He said, and he let out a valuable piece of information that there are five countries right now, other than the U S Russia and China that are not just on the verge of having a nuclear weapon. They're essentially armed. Now, again, you're talking about a guy who, yeah. who, you know, we can all argue it had secrets in his bathroom. Right. Um, but five, five countries that have the, the secrets. Now I, you could argue that with what you just said, that there are these aliens that are looking out for us. We're like three-year-olds with a, with a, you know, flamethrower in our hand. Well, there's more three-year-olds running around with flamethrowers mm -hmm. in their hands. Excuse me. And they're, they're huge ones at that. Right. Um, yeah. And the fact that he came, just came out and, and, and he even said, I'm deeply disturbed by it. The fact that there are these five new countries and he named them that have these, and, he's, and, and he then went on to say, and I don't know whether you believe him or not, that at one point during his term, they had had a deal on the table to de-escalate all nuclear weapons between Russia, China, and the U.S. And get them off the table because they were too dangerous. It was just too much. Again, take it for what you want. I think at that point... I'll ask you two questions. This is a double-headed question here. Do you believe in, in your heart of hearts that we ever get to a point where we put down the nuclear weapons and these, these beings say, you've done good, we back off, but we'll, you know, and, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on you from afar? And two, would it ever be possible that we could do that? Because... Everybody wants power. So as long as the technology in Pandora's box has been opened, it's out there, right? Somebody's going to want the power. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, you know, I think that, I think that there, would, there will be something that will unify us to such a point that these things will happen and um i also think that the the nuclear uh period uh phase uh experimentation i think just about every civilization you know even in our galaxy has passed through a dangerous nuclear age because if the knowledge comes before maturity, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a, a horror show. So, uh, you know, I think that, um, I think that the beings that are, that are visiting us and attempting to help us without, you know, telling us what to do or controlling things, I think they do believe in a time where that will happen because it is going to be necessary. They, they can't risk how dangerous we are right now. Uh, it's 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 a very it's a very critical time. We have really, you know, two roads. But I think that we're ready. I think disclosure has been a grassroots movement. I think that uh, the 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 people of our planet can handle a lot of things way better than anyone thinks that we can. And um, I also think that. 
not being alone in the universe, being all from some central creative force somehow. I think these things can happen because they have happened on other planets with bipedal humanoids, or they wouldn't be where they are, looking at us, trying to help. But, you know, the great Stanton Friedman, God bless him, he, um, you know, he once told me, and I thought this was such a a astute statement, he said, once a civilization understands how their sun works, they're going to figure out nuclear power. Yeah. So it is also probably part of a natural process. So I yes, I'm a glass half full person and it's been very it's been very difficult for me to see my um my home country sliding backwards into ignorance and 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 racism and other things that I thought were done. You know, I thought we took care of that stuff in the late sixties and the seventies, you know, and to have to see these book burnings and i i mean it's 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 surreal but it 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 is also a cry f- for help because if we don't redistribute wealth and end poverty and and make education feasible and wonderful and possible for everyone you know we should just kiss it goodbye now because uh we have social problems that begin in the womb, you know, and it has to do with largely with education and nutrition. And you may laugh at me by saying that, but, you know, that's that is a big part of brain development. There are children in the United States that are living in starvation levels in our own country. So, you know, can you imagine what a what a wonderful impact free energy could have? And I believe that that technology exists and has existed since the dawn of time. And the and the ancient Egyptians knew how to use it by drawing energy right out of the earth itself. Tesla knew how to use it. Can you imagine that would create thousands of more jobs? People's living expenses would be infinitesimal compared to what they are now. Well, they announced. And the- so there there could be a clean ecological future. They announced at the beginning of the year that they figured out how to power an entire city with laser fusion, but that they wouldn't have the technology and how to do it for 10 years, which I I don't buy. I don't buy that they can't, you know, they can't, they can't put that online for 10 years. You know, they they could, they could figure out how to do solar in a matter of just a few years. Um, But that, that you can't, you can't come up with laser fusion for 10 years. Uh, come on. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't work. That's ridiculous. Now this technology exists. It exists. And, uh, so there are things like this that could be so profound for our civilization because we have to, we have to feed our people. And also, and this is not really a political statement. It's really not. It's about balance. Until we have a balance between male and female, and that I don't care how people identify. That's not what I'm saying. It's not what I mean. Female energies and male energies. We have been living in a patrilineal civilization with men and their testosterone and their anger and their and their, you know, and all of that stuff. Now, I'm not saying that all men are like that, but I think politics can attract those kinds of people because it's a type of show business. And, you know, megalomania, megalomania runs rampant on both sides of the of the question. So that's, you know, I'm not making this political, but I think with the balance like they're starting to have in Europe, of uh, female exec- major executives, premiers, presidents, I think the female energy is going to save the world. That's what I think. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, let's let's get back to the topic at hand here. Let's talk a little bit about. Um, okay. I want to talk a little bit about the ET babysitting the world, so to speak. I, I, I have, and mm-hmm. you, you talked about mm-hmm. the, 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 
the amount of positive versus negative experiences. I want to I want to focus on why is it that we hear about the negative, not so much the positive. Why is it that I hear more about people having negative experiences, the the probing, the pain, the implants, than I do. Well, we got together, we had a nice time. They, they you know, love and light and all that. I don't hear a lot of that. I hear a lot of. I've got this implant inside of me. I don't know what it is. Lost time. Right. Well, it makes it, it makes good copy. It, it makes good copy. It makes television. Mm-hmm. But you know, the, let me just let me just go back in time a little bit here to the end of World War II, right? And the Roswell crash. Um, well, first of all, there were I believe there were three vehicles with bodies and some alive that crashed that day. We were using some type of sonic uh, weapon that they weren't prepared for that brought them down, some type of anti-gravity sonic weapon of some sort. And um, there were survivors. And these beings were from, uh, they they were Zeta Reticulites. They were from a a binary star system. In other words, they're the same beings, uh, what you would call the greys, the same beings who visited Betty and who who, um, abducted Betty and Barney Hill. That's the same beings. They have been involved with us for millennia um, and way back into pre-unrecorded history. At any rate, um, at the time of this crash and the capturing of the the technology and the craft and the bodies, um, the beings offered to make a deal. And they call this, you know, initially it's called the Truman Agreement because Truman was president at, in this post-war time. So the deal was that um, these the Zeta Reticulites would give us technology that we could manage, but that wouldn't, you know, disrupt our our monetary system. Blah blah blah. And in exchange, they were having a genetic crisis. Um, uh, they could no longer reproduce. They needed help. We are we have some DNA in common that we share. So they wanted permission to simply take some DNA from some, a very few random citizens. Well, well, we got the technology, which of course is things like um, that came up overnight, integrated circuits, uh, fiber optics, um, Velcro. <laughs> Velcro, really? We got all of that stuff. Huh. And uh, yeah. I guess you got to get something out of it, right? And uh, but this this uh, good grief, but this abduction and painful extraction of DNA and all this kind of stuff uh, was out of control, and uh, was becoming almost like a commonplace experience. God knows how many people they involved in their fertility program. And I, I have had experienced your clients that uh, have told me about having hybrid children brought to them. And, you know, I've, you know, I've heard, you know, I have horrible stories about, you know, painful extraction of, of ova and, and sperm and using um, uh, psionic techniques to confuse and, and, and muddle you. So you think that you're you're with a physical person, but you're not. I mean, I've heard some stuff that is so far out, but it was all about getting those that ova and those sperm and doing some kind of regeneration of their fertility program. Anyway, that agreement, which it was later called the Eisenhower Agreement, that agreement timed out and the Zeta Reticulites kept their word about what the agreed time was. My personal guess is that it's in the early 90s sometime, early to mid 90s, because I don't really hear about those types of things occurring through that, right? Okay. So I think that's what happened. So those experiences that you're talking about are real. They happened. Um, But what I can say is the people to which they happened are very much senior people at this point in 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 history they would be 70 80 years old okay so you're saying that that type of rampant impregnation for lack of a better term 
uh, mm -hmm. isn't happening anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's a, that kind of thing is is done. Um, what we have now um, are more like um, people working together uh, on on projects that are kind of mysterious and and we have uh, we do have um, you know people having examinations but they're not involving pain it it can and uh, we do have um, implants but they are etheric implants um, and it's kind of a different situation than the kinds of implants that Dr. Lear examined so thoroughly uh, back in the day. So um, the kinds of beings that are engaging with us, th that I hear about the most, and believe me, there are all kinds of beings. There are aquatic beings. There, I mean, it's, you know, there are all kinds of beings, but we are apparently very closely related genetically to any beings from the Lyran system, which means like a uh, uh, Pleiadians and Arcturians, I think. Um, and if there is, in fact, a planet called Nibiru that has that large elliptical orbit uh, and those beings did come to our planet, we are, they are also in the Lyran system. So we're related, you know, we would share DNA. Um, so m many of the encounters are with what I would call humanoid, I mean, not shocking but you know humanoid beings i think the arcturians are a multi-race people but they tend to have blue bluish skin their their blood system operates on copper not on uh, iron so uh so there are those lyrans and the uh the pleiadians or what you would call the tall nordics they are engaging so uh there aren't too many uh, beings that are that are terrifying, or these beings are able to make themselves seem um, uh, humanoid-like. I I don't have the answer to that question, but I okay. I, I tend to think that there is a kind of a uh, a, a pattern for for beings, you know, bipedal beings that uh, is is quite common in the universe. Would be my my thinking, but I, of course I'm not sure. Um, there are um, uh, reptilian beings, but they are not necessarily all bad by any means. In fact, one of my um, clients who gave me an awful lot of information uh, said that the, you know, certain groups of the of the reptilians are known as the as the galaxy's top uh, geneticists. So they're often involved in processes. So there are, you know, I think, you know, like anything else, there are good guys and bad guys, just like on our planet. And our planet is a grand experiment. We're told that it's unique in that there are, there are so many beings at different stages of development within one world. And it, it seems that that is a, that is rather a rarity in our corner of the galaxy. Okay. Tell you what, we're behind in our break. Let's take our break. When we come back, I want to ask you, have you run across anybody who's maybe a product of one of these unions? Have they come to you and asked, who am I? What am I? And why am I here? We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about some of the other things you might have run across in your in your practice as well. Uh, Leslie Mitchell Clark is our guest. She's a skilled hypnotherapist who specializes in regression. And we'll talk more about aliens. And we might even have time to get into some past life stuff as well. When we come back right here on The Best in Paranormal Podcasting, this is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Our guest is Leslie Mitchell Clark, and we are talking about, well, we're talking about all things alien. We're talking about alien abductions. We're talking about aliens in general. We're talking about trauma. We're talking about, uh, well, we're going to talk about in this segment, what happens when 
uh, these particular beings reproduce. And let's talk about the progeny of these beings, Leslie. And okay. I want to know, in your practice, if you've ever come across the progeny of these beings, these alien-human hybrids, and if you've ever had an alien-human hybrid come to you and say, you know what, I feel like I'm different. And can you tell me, I think I've had an experience with mm -hmm. maybe an alien parent, and uh, mm -hmm. but I don't remember it. Can you actually take me back and tell me who I am, where I come from? And I think I have had experiences, but I don't remember. Can you help me remember? Yeah. Well, this that would be a fairly common thing uh, because people who are having these experiences often dream of another planet. They often don't feel like they totally belong here. They have those sorts of sensations. Now, I have never, um, I have never seen any of these clients um, have what I would call overtly ET or unusual features. But that doesn't mean that they couldn't be carrying very special DNA. You know, I mean, there. Um, I have also had um, um, people tell me that their DNA was enhanced in the womb after their mother had already conceived them, which also is an interesting point of view. But these things were not the, the this this enhancement um, kind of thing is something that I have often heard about hmm. so i think the whole question of of hybridization is that uh we have been visited and involved with ets really since the dawn of time i mean all we have to do is look at you know petroglyphs like you know in, in, in like in, in the kimberly rock in um australia or my God, some Neolithic uh, um, things in, in Ireland and um, amazing stuff in Eastern Europe. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty compelling. There is pretty compelling evidence that we have been involved with different types of beings for millennia since, since our very, very beginnings. And um, I think that um, I think they view us as cousins or relatives. I think some of the beings feel like they have responsibility for us. Some beings are not that interested in us. They just, they're, they're, they're just blase. They, they're not really that interested, but I think that we have genetic connections already in our genome, which makes all of this stuff kind of possible. Now, I'm not talking about what the greys were doing. They were definitely splicing genes. God knows what they were doing. Now, when I've had clients describe to me what these children look like when they bring them to them, it's usually some of them look so human that you would never know, but they're kind of delicate. They're kind of fine boned, they're kind of delicate. And then some of the children have maybe no hair or some will have only some hair or they will have very profoundly elongated eyes with the large irises in the way that we have heard these things described. So, uh, and I, as I understand it, when I ask questions, cause that's what I'm doing with these lovely people all the time, I'm trying to get at truths. Um, I was told that some of the some of the children are raised so that they just uh, participate in the human world, mm -hmm. and and uh, and others are not able to leave the ship for uh, uh, for for um, what would the reason atmospheric reasons I, I I don't know why that is but some of them have to stay on the ship really they can't go down. Yeah, that I know. They're too. They have the balance is too much, uh, too much ET DNA and not quite enough human to be able to survive 
on our earth. Interesting. And yet it's very rare to see any kind of incident on a craft or whatever where everybody isn't appearing to breathe the same air. You know, all the species and the humans. I, I haven't really heard about, I have heard about the atmosphere feeling thick or thick thicker if you if that makes any sense almost like a almost like a humidity i've heard that but i have never heard of any special um breathing apparatus that is worn either by the ets or the or the humans from our planet interesting, um, interesting. hybridization has is is something that has taken a deep emotional toll on these people that lived through those brutal types of procedures back in the day. Um, and because they immediately, some of these people never had children in this life, or mm -hmm. they just, they or they are a parent, and being a parent, that parent stuff turns on right away. Yeah. And, and, um, and I know that they have to almost sometimes forcibly take the children away. And uh, I had a a guy who was he was a he was a judge by the way i think a superior court judge and he was sobbing in my chair you know over the grief of having these children that he just got to see taken away from him so this is this this was a horrible program uh any kind of way that you wish to look at it um, these people had sleeping disorders because they were always being taken at night. It was terrible, absolutely terrible. And it was, and the fact that it was allowed for the sake of greed, for the sake of technology, people suffered. And they suffered a lot. So it's, uh, it's a very complex issue, but I, I feel very clear in saying that this type of experience is thankfully very rare okay. um, in our present time. Those aren't the kinds of experiences people seem to be having. So how do you how do you reconcile this then, Leslie? How do you, how do you how do your clients take and morph this into a collaborative process? From how do they go from being taken to make this uh, a collaboration mm. between alien and human? Okay. All right. Well, very often when we get in there, Tim, when we, when we, when I say I take someone back to their first encounter and maybe they're three or something, then they can see these things as they really happened. Then it's not so scary because little children, you know, even the dreams you have or the things you think they're distorted, they're not, they're not accurate usually. So, having the individual go back and move through different experiences, particularly ones that may have disturbed them for which they have partial memory. Um, what we're doing is we're shining the light. We're shining the light on the truth. And invariably it's, it's not, it's, that is a relieving thing. It's not a traumatic thing because, um, what that person thought as a little child um, is not what their their memory has stored. Um, and we get accuracy, you know, from that, the hypnosis process happens in the deep amygdala. We get, you know, we get a lot of accuracy with that. But um, also um, I would say that um, it's very possible after working with someone and working through their their episodes. And and one thing I want your your listeners to to really understand, um, I am against fear. Fear is the killer. Fear fear in our lives. Fear is terrible. It, we we don't want it. So um, we have techniques in hypnotherapy where um, as we watch the client and that's what I'm doing. I'm a serving with an eagle eye and we're looking for respiration. We're looking for um, uh, circulation. We're looking for all kinds of signs. And um, if that person begins to experience any distress, I mean, 
even a facial tick, any distress whatsoever about what they're recalling, I immediately turn them into an observer. Then I have them floating up at the top of the ceiling and looking down on the events, and they are able to process the events without um, involving any negative emotions. Ah, okay. So that's an amazing thing about the human brain, that we can actually do that. Now, it's a kind of desensitization, of course, and but we used to think, or not me personally, but at the turn of the last century, if someone had a phobia or fear, they, they used to feel that that person had to be exposed physically to that same fear again and again and again until they finally had no reactivity left. Hence, you know, the snake pit in the old uh, mental hospitals, right? Right. Oh, God. But um, what what is actually the case is there is no need ever to re-experience the trauma because it can the experience can be understood and processed and incorporated. So what I am doing really is helping assisting these dear people who incorporate this aspect of their lives, this specialness, this aspect of their lives back into their psyche and without fear, without shame, uh, with complete access to their memories and also empower them. Because the thing is, you can, a, a lot of my people are involved now in what I would almost have to call kind of a channeling exercise. They are certainly able to communicate with the beings that they are engaging with in real time. Um, so that's a very fascinating kind of development that and and it's a fascinating kind of collaboration that now these people are capable of doing so truth truth is the healer no matter how bad it is looking at the truth accepting it and this is true in all psychotherapy truth will heal but it, it's just how how it's shown to that person and you know i do everything with compassion and um no one is ever i will never allow anyone to experience a traumatic episode when i'm working with them so mm. that's one thing i did want to point out right i can't speak for other people who do this work some people i can't speak for everybody because you know i was fortunate enough blessed to learn all of my regression techniques from uh, Dr. Georgina Cannon, who is a very major, major figure in the field of regression therapy, and uh, so I, everything that I that I do is an adaptation of her techniques. Okay. Okay. So, and it's all about it's all about the well-being and the safety and the feelings of security and trust with the patient. Excellent. Excellent. Um, got a few minutes left here in the program. Uh, I wanted to get to the subject of implants. I, have you had uh, clients who have had implants in the past? Oh. And if so, was it dangerous to them to have had them implanted? Have they, have they gone through personal injury because of it? Have they, have they eventually had to have them out? And, and have you been witness to this? Have, have you had any interesting stories about that? Well, I, I have one kind of close personal experience with that, but I will say that as far as we know, there are really two different types of implants that people receive depending on what their experience is. One is uh, is of military origin, and we're not quite sure what that's designed to do. They're not, you know, they're not uh, tracking devices because everybody, every being on the planet has their own individual brain signature. And once you know that, you can just key into it. You don't. They can find anybody they want. Mm -hmm. They don't need a little, you know, metal uh, nodule or whatever it is. Now the other types of implants are 
willingly accepted by the experiencers. And what they are is, I suppose, the closest way to describe that is they're kind of a step up transformer for increased um, uh, psychic ability and awareness, really? that kind of thing. Huh. So the ETs will will help or assist the, the benevolent ones will help or assist um, certain certain clients if they want to. For instance, I one of my longtime clients is a very very busy remote viewer, and he attributes part of that with desiring to do that kind of work and being given a little bit of technological help. Now, many of those types of implants just dissolve when they are done working and it's they're there not forever but for a short time and i have also heard about some of these implants working on just the etheric body or the astral body and not the physical body so that's another whole aspect of stuff that's pretty far out now my personal experience was i was shooting a um a, a, a television show that it, ne- it, was, it was a pilot. It never actually happened. But the guy that, that created it went on to Gaia to do a bunch of stuff over there. So okay. this, was, <laughs> this was his little project. So he was wanted very much to find somebody with an implant. And, um, and he did somehow. He found a young girl. She and her brother and the mother had been as stationed up on the do line. Again, this is a Canadian situation. Mm -hmm. The girl's from Montreal, I believe. And so finally, um, uh, uh, Sid finally found a doctor, a surgeon, who would remove this implant. Now, it was right on her, like on her shoulder right there. And it was magnetic, like you could, you could attach things to the arm and they would just hang there. Oh my God. So whatever was in there had metals and was magnetized. Yeah. So, um, so the thing was removed up in Montreal and, um, I saw, uh, pictures of it when it came out and it looked like a little, a tiny little barbell, except one side was a slightly smaller ball than the other end. Hmm. Now, it was also covered in some, as one would expect, some fascia and some material because it had been, I think it had moved, I think it had grown out, you know, to the point was really bothering her. So then he had it, you know, analyzed, you know, uh, uh, with a kind of some kind of mass spectrometer. And indeed, there were elements there that were not identifiable. Interesting. So... It's a little mysterious. Very so, mysterious. Yeah, a little mysterious. But in that situation, everything was done medically and by the book. I think it was at uh, the head of the university science department in Montreal did the analysis, I believe. And um, so now I know when uh, Dr. Lear, the great Dr. Lear, who was the leading guy in, in dealing with these implants, uh, I mean, he reported that uh, they they had EMF emanations. In other words, you could put a little EMF meter, but they were all signal. They had like, I think this had to be the U.S. Army, but there were radio signals coming out. Sometimes when they were exposed to air, when he removed them, they dissolved immediately. Huh. Sometimes they moved around the body in kind of a snake-like way, and it was very difficult to get them out. Yeah. And he actually pulled one out. And this is this is all information you can see on YouTube. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Roger Lear. One of them looked like a little like a centipede. You know, so you've seen uh, some of this stuff. Yeah. So um I have never known anyone who experienced anything like that. But I have known people who have sworn that they have an implant, it's not bothering them. Uh, and it's working for them, and it's it's going to dissolve. So there you have it. You okay. know all that I know. Okay. So, but it seems feasible that with technology, they, that they could be doing using some type of device to stimulate maybe the pineal gland. Who knows? Right. Right. It's not impossible. Right. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we have you know we have you know patches that leak stuff into our system yes so yeah 
why not an implant of some sort? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, last question here uh, before we wrap up here, Leslie. Um, so we've got the we've got people who have had this resulting trauma, or the, they've they're they're trying to get through their day and, and trying to process what it is that they've they've gone yes. through here with with a different uh, race of an existing alien and. And they want to get back to being happy. Let's face it; they want to they want to function mm-hmm. in society. They want to get through their day. They want to be a normal human being. Uh, yeah. How do we get them from point A to point B? Yeah. How do you eventually get them to be a happy, functional, aware humanoid on this planet? Well, they do. They do. Um, once we start reducing the trauma they've been carrying. Once they feel accepted, and then I often encourage people to, you know, listen to shows like yours and, if, and or, you know, participate, join a group, join MUFON, where they will meet many people who are like them. So they often begin to feel, you know, part of a community as well. I think one of the biggest problems every experiencer has to deal with is uh, insomnia because it begins with them being fearful of being taken during the night. To the point where they're hyper vigilant and they just cannot sleep. Um, so one of the ways that I have helped with this is um, I asked one of my clients to make a deal with them to explain to them about sleep, about how we need it. We need eight hours. It might seem very bizarre to them. You know, they may not understand our sleep cycles and also make a deal with them that you'll go anywhere with them on the weekend and participate in whatever projects you're doing. But Monday through Friday, you have to have decent sleep with no interruptions. And it worked. Really? Huh. I, I suppose yeah, negotiation is the best way, right? Just like that in my chair. Yes, yes. Just in my in his chair. You see, these are, you know, these are, this is not God. These are beings who are imperfect like we are. How could they possibly understand everything about us and, and our sleep schedules and REM sleep? How could they possibly know everything that we really can't be interrupted and have our sleep disrupted over a long period of time or we lose our minds? So getting the sleep back online is always a priority. And thus far, I've managed to have great success with that. Thank God. There you go. There you go. I, that's, that's a great way to start. I, I mean, a, a good night's sleep is always a great way to start. That's for sure. And, and being able to negotiate. It is. And, and, it is. Yeah, and being able to have a little bit yeah. of peace and peace and quiet, I think, is a, is a good way to to get things on the right track. Yes. Right. Yeah. We are not powerless. We're, we are primarily collaborators in trying to lift up our fellow humans into a more civilized, kinder, better way of being. And it's possible. There you go. There you go. Uh, you have a book out there called Intersection, A True Story of Extraterrestrial Contact. We'll have a link to it in the description of this program so people can go out and learn more about you, as well as oh, great. a link to the website so people can get to know you as well. Uh, Leslie Mitchell Clark, I want to thank you so much for being on the program cool. today. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. It was such a pleasure. I wish I was there in Minneapolis with you right now. We could saunter on down to the Loon Saloon. That's what I wish. Absolutely. But uh, maybe sometime, maybe there will be a big event, UFOlogy event in Minneapolis, and I'll just, I'll, I'll be there. If you're running it, I'll be there. I'll buy the, I'll buy the first Loon Burger. How's that sound? That's. <laughs> <laughs> You got it. I, I, hey, I love the I love the burger at the Loon Cafe. So that that uh, you got a deal there. So I know, I know, it's really good. So that that's a deal there. So okay, man. Well, thank you, Tim. 
That's a deal. You got it. You, you got it. <laughs> you take care and thank you so much again. And I, I look forward to, uh, you know, chatting. We didn't even talk about reincarnation, but we've got some, I got some wild stuff there too. That's right. We can well, get into that another time. We'll have you back on, <laughs> Leslie, most definitely. Thank you so much. Leslie Mitchell Clark, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank Leslie Mitchell Clark for being on the big program today. She does have a book out there, Intersection, A True Story of Extraterrestrial Contact. We've got a link in the description of this program. Go ahead and pick that book up. Also, we've got a link in the description of the program for her website in case uh, you've had a negative experience, possibly with an entity, and you would like to be seen about it. Maybe you've had a positive one, too. I don't know. Maybe you have. Maybe you want to be seen with that as well. Uh, you can get a hold of Leslie, and she'll be happy to help you there as well. That'll do it for this week, folks. Uh, we are done. We are out of here next week already is Halloween. It came so quickly, didn't it? Got a big Halloween show for you next week. Um, we also have a really big tr True Crime Tuesday for you. Big week for you next week. So uh, very, very happy how this month has turned out. Again, if you have a guest you'd like to hear on the big show, just email me, tim at darknessradio.com. I'm always happy to take your suggestions. And a lot of times I, I turn them right around and I make them guests. So I'm always happy to get your suggestions and get them booked right here on the big show. So I'm very happy to turn those right around for you. Please check out our store at darknessradioshow.com. Not only do you help support the show with your monetary contributions, but you get really cool stuff in return. It's kind of a neat deal. Um, we have new alien LED lights up, alien head LED lights up at the, at the shop. Uh, we've also got some other cool stuff as well. I may even have one or two little Bigfoot statues available. Uh, I think I may have those up at the, sh at the shop. Um, there's some other cool uh, swag in there as well. So check it out. Uh, myself and the chipmunks will appreciate it. <laughs> That's all I can say there. Uh, let's see, what else is going on this weekend? Uh, lots of good stuff. I, can't, I Every time I come to this, I go, you know, I should have mentioned this, I should have mentioned that, I should have mentioned the other thing. And there's always like one or two housekeeping issues there. Check out our social media. Uh, if you're not aware of where it is, go to darknessradioshow.com. Our social media links are listed there. Uh, the Darkness Radio app. I haven't mentioned the Apple app in a while. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, there is an Apple app that you can use. Uh, you can look in the uh, you can look in the uh, the store there on Apple. Uh, just type in Darkness Radio if you're looking for an easier way to listen to it. Go to the App Store, type in uh, Darkness Radio. It'll come right up, and that's one easy way for us to get us if you don't want to listen to us on any of the other ways that you normally get your podcasts. If you're confused about how to get us on podcast, again, go to the front page, darknessradioshow.com, and there it is. Uh, and that's an easy way to do it. Oh, I know, one final thing. We've been on YouTube for a while now, and we'd like to see, if you'd like to see our face, I know I mentioned on Supernatural News and Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals, I mentioned video, and some of you have been like, video, where's the video? Uh, darknessradioshow.com is the easiest way to get both the audio and video all in the same place. So if you click on one of the shows that you want to hear or see, you click on the header and both audio and video will pop up if it's available for that show. You'll see the YouTube link or the YouTube uh, screen for that show. And then underneath will be the audio link. It's really sweet. It's all in the same place, but it's only at darknessradioshow.com. Now, Here's the important part. We would like you to subscribe to the YouTube page. It's real easy to find. The Original Darkness Radio. That's it. Just look for The Original Darkness Radio on YouTube and you'll find us. Pretty simple, right? So, over the weekend, if you'd like some homework, go to The Original Darkness Radio. You'll be able to find all the shows there. Or just go to darknessradioshow.com. Look up the video section and follow that, and you can subscribe that way as well. So we, uh, we'd we like you to do that as well. The reason being is not only are there videos of some of the newer shows up, but also the archive is there as well, the archive of the old shows. Now, no, there's not video highlights from the old days. That's not, that's not the, the deal. But the audio shows are up from the old days. 
they just have a card in in the video section of of Scully. So there you go. But the uh, the audio is up on YouTube now. So there's an audio archive there. So there you go. It's not a full audio archive. There's there's a few years that are missing, but uh, working hard to eventually fill that in. So it's going to take some time, though, folks. There's a few years missing, and it's only me here. So keep that in mind. <laughs> It's one of those projects where, you know, if I get a spare night where I'm not sleeping, that's when I'm filling it in. So that's that's what's happening there. I guess I'll throw that out there, too. Um, if you are a uh, person who's got extensive audio experience and uh, I can trust you not to steal the keys to my car, uh, <laughs> hit me up. Uh, Tim at DarknessRadio.com. I could use an unpaid intern to help me out with some audio stuff. Uh, yeah, Tim at darknessradio.com. And uh, if you'd like to help out with some uh, some audio production, I could use some help there. So, all right, that'll do it. Uh, we'll see you next, next week, a big week, Halloween week. It's an exciting week. Halloween, uh, Sam Hain, however you want to put it. Uh, we have got exciting things in store for you. And uh, I'm excited about next week. I really am. Uh, we're turning the corner here, folks. Boy, it's going to start getting colder. The days are getting shorter, but it's an exciting time of year, isn't it? Uh, this is what we're all looking forward to. I'm looking forward to all the little kids and the trick-or-treaters and, and just having a good time next week. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for weeks, so I'm thinking you are too. Um, in the meantime, be a light in someone's darkness this weekend. I know the Anoka Halloween Parade is this weekend. I think I may go check it out. Um, so while you're in Anoka, uh, go visit some of the local establishments. Go say hi to some of the people in Anoka, Minnesota, if you're here in Minnesota. Halloween capital of the world. Isn't that cool? Gotta love it. You gotta love Minnesota, right? All right, I'm out of here. Take care. For Jessica Freeberg, from Mally Fox, for Beer City Bruiser, I'm Tim Dennis. Thank you so much for spending your hard-earned time with us right here on The Best in True Crime and Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio.